many students think of commas like uh, string theory or something to that effect. I mean, they just think that there's so many rules and so many exceptions to the rule, they'll probably never learn it. And so why try? If this is you, I hope to uh, disabuse you of that notion today. Uh, it's really not true. Commas, there's not that many rules. It's not that big of a deal. It's just a few concepts. And once you grasp those, it's smooth sailing, okay? Let's do it. So I've always thought that the, the shortcut or the way to, uh, to learn how to use commas and to have much better punctuation in general is to be able to identify the parts of a sentence, the, the different building blocks. So that's what we're going to start with. A phrase. You've heard it. You've heard it. Pat Sajak, it's a phrase, whatever. You've heard it many, many times, but what does it mean? It means a group of words without a subject or a verb that cannot stand alone as a complete thought. Great. The, really, the number one type of phrase is a prepositional phrase, and that's really the only one you'll have cause to deal with. The next part... Okay, so I have a I have a uh, an example here. So you can see there, a prepositional phrase is right here around the side. That's the first one. Okay, of the house. Second one, on the porch. So there are three prepositional phrases starting off this sentence: around the side of the house on the porch. Those are all prepositional phrases. There are three of them. All right. Great. Fine. Wonderful. What is a clause? A clause is a group of words that has a subject and a verb. Period. But what is an independent clause? It is a group of words that has a subject and a verb and can, can stand alone as a complete thought. Now let's talk about this complete thought business for a second, because it becomes very important. A complete thought, what is it? If you walked up to someone in the hallway and said, uh, although I got into the shower with my socks on this morning, <laughs> and yeah, that's weird, and then just walked off. Although I got into the shower with my socks on this morning and just walked off. It's not a complete thought. Those people are going to think you are crazy. Number one, what are you doing getting in the shower with your socks on? That's weird. It's, it's weird. It's weird. Number two, it's not a complete... You, you, you come up and tell me something about getting in the shower with your socks on, and then you leave me hanging? That's a double win. That, you know, you just, man. Okay. That is not a complete thought. Now, if you were to just walk up to someone and say, I got into the shower with my socks on this morning. That is a complete thought. But when you put that word although in front of it, it necessarily needs more to complete the thought. Right? Okay, here we go. An independent clause is a group of words, a group of words with a subject and a verb that can stand alone as a complete thought. Hey man, Joe hit the ball. Check it, check it, check it, check it. We have Joe, subject, Joe's the subject. We have hit, that is the verb. And then we have ball, that's the direct object. Great, that's a complete sentence. Joe hit the ball, wonderful, great. We are so happy with ourselves. Now, a dependent clause, otherwise known as subordinate clause. Subordinate means something is over you, something is in charge of you. If you have a boss at work, you are her subordinate. So a subordinate clause is a dependent clause. Just key in on that word dependent. Dependent, a group of words with a subject and a verb that cannot stand alone as a complete thought. Let's see what I have here. Ooh, okay. Although, you can see down here, although... Although storm clouds were approaching the stadium, Joe hit the ball. 
great, wonderful. You cannot walk up to someone in the hallway and say, although storm clouds were approaching the stadium, and walk away. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. It's, you should try it. I mean, <laughs> although storm clouds were approaching the stadium is the dependent clause. You say, oh, what's a clause then? Oh, a clause is a group of words with a subject and a verb. Okay, well, where's the subject and where's the verb? Hmm. Although storm clouds were approaching. Hey, look, clouds is the subject. Were approaching is the verb. So we have a subject and a verb, but it can't stand alone as a, as a, as a complete thought. Indeed. So, this is a dependent clause right here. The first part, it's in reddish brick red or whatever. And then this is an independent clause. Independent clause, dependent clause. Independent clause, dependent clause. Good, great, wonderful. Moving on. Now, now that we have that, here are the different sentence types. There are four. There are only four types of sentences. Simple, complex, compound, and compound complex. A simple sentence is a, is, has one independent clause. But do not be fooled. Some simple sentences are long and complex. Just because it only has one independent clause doesn't mean that it has to be tiny like cats hunt mice, right? It can be a very long, just ask Ernie Hemi, Ernest Hemingway is famous for the 25 word simple sentence, you know. So nonetheless, here we go. We have, we have our, our, uh, our examples here. Cats hunt mice. Full, full complete thought? Yes. Walk up to anyone in the hall and say that, and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. They'll think you're weird. Jamie is beautiful. I put that there because this is what's called a linking verb. It links the subject of the sentence to the predicate. In this case, it's a predicate adjective. But Jamie is beautiful. Full sentence, full stop, boom. That's an independent clause. I see there. Joe hit the ball and ran the bases. Uh-oh. All right. Uh-oh. Now, check it. Check it, check it, check it, check it. Joe hit the ball. We already covered that. That is a full sentence. It's an independent clause. How about Anne ran the bases? Isn't that another independent clause? No, because what is it lacking? It is lacking a second subject. It's lacking a sec second subject. Now look down here. Joe hit the ball and he ran the bases. That has two independent clauses. Joe hit the ball is one, and he ran the bases is the second one. But Joe hit the ball and ran the bases, you can't walk up to someone in the hallway and say, ran the bases. No. So that makes it a compound predicate, not, not a second independent clause. Great, wonderful, oh, wonderful. What do you, I thought you were gonna talk about commas. Shauna Felt, good grief. Okay, I will, I will. Complex sentence has one independent clause and at least one dependent clause. Let's look at one. Billy hit the ball because he is a star athlete. Check it out. This is the dependent portion right here. Billy hit the ball because he is a star athlete. You can't walk up to someone in the hall and say, because. Because he's a star, star athlete, no. Now we reverse it on the next one. Because he is a star athlete, comma, Billy hit the ball. Great, fine. That is the dependent clause portion of that sentence, and this is the dependent clause portion of this sentence. It's just kind of reversed. That makes this a complex sentence because it has a dependent clause and an independent clause. He is a star athlete is the independent clause. The, the uh, I'm sorry, uh, Billy hit the ball is the independent clause because he is a star athlete is the dependent portion. Although storm clouds were approaching the stadium, Joe hit the ball. We covered this one. It's a complex sentence because it has one independent clause, Joe hit the ball, and one 
dependent clause, although storm crowds were approaching the stadium. Good. Now, a compound sentence is just what it sounds like. It is two or more independent clauses put together in one sentence. Now, notice up here I have DCIC. So that's dependent clause, independent clause, at least one dependent clause. There can be many dependent clauses, but that, that is the makings of a complex sentence. But a compound sentence has an independent two at least two independent clauses. There could be 500 independent clauses in there, whatever, but it has to have at least two. And keep in mind, a compound sentence has no dependent clauses, none. Let's look at some. The police arrived. That's the first independent clause. Walk up to someone in the hallway and say, the police arrived, and they're going to run. <laughs> They'll know what you're talking about. It's not, it's not a fragment. It's not a, a phrase. It is an independent clause. It stands alone as a complete thought. How about the next part? The police arrived. We were still frightened. Yes, indeed. So you have two. You have two independent clauses. Right. Good. How about this next one? Joe hit the ball. And he ran the bases. We covered that just a second ago. Independent clause, independent clause. Good. Now, I want you to know that there are but two ways in the entire universe. There are two ways to combine independent clauses into one sentence. Two. But two. And that's it. With a comma and a coordinating conjunction or with a semicolon. People hate semicolons. They ha semicolons have the worst reputation ever. I, I urge you not to use them. They're just, I don't know. There's no rhyme or reason for it, but English professors, English teachers in general, frown upon them. Nonetheless, this is correct. Joe hit the ball, semicolon. He ran the bases. That's a perfectly good sentence. Uh, independent clause on both sides of the... Uh, semicolon which is required now compound complex to end it compound complex is a variety of all of the above it has at least two independent clauses and at least one dependent clause although the police had arrived here's the dependent portion although the police had arrived that's the first dependent clause okay Although the police had arrived, you can't walk up to someone in the hallway and say, although the police had arrived, they need more. They need more. Although the police had arrived, that is the dependent clause portion, we thought the burglars may still be in the house. Complete sentence. We thought the burglars may still be in the house. We thought they were there. That's the first independent clause. And then the second independent clause is, so we were frightened. So you have, you have three portions here. You have a dependent clause and two independent clauses all put together in one sentence. That is a compound complex sentence. Right. Great. All right. Moving on. The first comma rule I want to talk about is using commas with introductory elements. Use a comma after introductory clauses, phrases, and words that come before the main clause of the sentence. With this, we're really talking about the, at the beginning of a sentence. At the beginning of a sentence, if there is an introductory clause, an introductory phrase, or an introductory word, anything that introduces the main clause which is coming, put a comma to separate it from the main cl clause. So, you can see here, However you get there, however you get there, look, however you get there, comma, please come to my party. What's the main portion of this sentence? Please come to my party. That is the independent clause. That is the independent clause in this sentence. So what is however you get there? Does it have a verb? Yes. Uh, I guess, yeah. However you get there. 
like get is this is like slaying it means however you transport your body there yeah yeah okay you subject get okay so that makes this a dependent clause it doesn't have to be a dependent clause in order for it to be an introductory element but you know now you're wise you've been you've been enlightened okay so however you get there comma please come to my party in order that we finish class we must take our exam in order that we finish class we must take our exam see that this is the introductory element right here and anytime you have an introductory element you 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 set it off with a comma all right and even though the classes are difficult, we feel a sense of accomplishment when they are finished. See right here, once again, you have it here. You have the, even though the classes are difficult, right here. That is the introductory element. This, in this case, it's a clause. In this case, it's a clause. And in all cases so far, they have been clauses. All right. When Jack arrived at Joe's house, he gave him a big hug. This right here is the is the uh, is the introductory element when Jack arrived at Joe's house. It's not a complete sentence. It's an introductory element. Put a comma after it. All right. All right. Now here's where we get into prepositional phrases. This we talked about it just a minute ago. This is a prepositional phrase around the side. A preposition shows a spatial orientation, a spatial relationship. It's around the side. It's of, the, the next one is of the house. Get it? On the porch. So remember, there are three prepositional phrases right there in a row. Three, around the side of the house, on the porch. Okay, the rule goes like this. If there is one prepositional phrase at the beginning of a sentence, for example, in 1945, if there is one prepositional phrase at the, at the beginning of a sentence, it is your choice as the writer whether or not to, to use the comma. If there are two or more prepositional phrases at the beginning of a sentence, then you need to use the comma to uh, set off this introductory element. For example, right here, in 1945, there was a great celebration when World War II ended. Notice I did not put a comma there because it is one prepositional phrase and it just breaks the flow. I mean, you could, it wouldn't be wrong, but, but it just breaks the flow. In 1945, there was a great celebration when World War II ended. In night. In 1944, in northern France, the Allied forces attacked German fortifications. Ah, 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 okay, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. This is easy, this is easy stuff. In 1945, first prepositional phrase. In northern France, second prep, okay, so there's two prepositional, phrase, prepositional phrases. I gotta have the comma, and I do. There it is. Shazam! All right, good, great, wonderful outstanding, superb, superior. Now, this is just a word. It's an introductory word, kind of like an a, a interjection. Well, that seems about right. Still, like I said up here, an introductory element can be anything from a clause to a phrase to a word. So yeah, well, well, comma, that seems about right. Nice, good, great. Same thing with yes, yes. The check is in the mail. Same thing with, however, you may not like the rocky beaches. So however, yes, and well are all introductory words. Let's call them that. All right. Now then, this is the next one. Okay, this is probably one of the more important ones. If you don't get this one right, then you're writing either fragments or run-on sentences. And nobody wants that. I mean, there are there are some rules you can get away with. I'm talking about in your in your 
cover letter, your resume. I mean, that has to be written to the highest level of standard American English you can achieve, right? If you have run-ons in there, oh man. If you have comma splices and run-ons and fragments and stuff like that, your whoever's reading that resume is going to have an instant impression of you. And it's going to be that you're uneducated. So this stuff's important, especially this. You don't want to have run-ons. It's one of the unforgivable sins. All right, here we go. It is, uh, by the way, a run-on sentence is two independent clauses joined in properly. That's it. It's not a sentence that's long. It's not a sentence that runs on. It's not a sentence with too many words in it. It is any sentence where two or more independent clauses are joined improperly. And what is the only two ways to join independent clauses? Ding, 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 ding. I just told you this. It is with a comma and a coordinating conjunction. That's the first way and the best way, really the only way if you ask me, or a semicolon, right? But we're dealing with commas and coordinating conjunctions right now. Check it out. These are the only ones that there are. There are no other coordinating conjunctions. And, or, nor, for, but, yet, so. S yep. Seven of them. So that, that's it. So that's the whole universe of, jo of joining sentences. Now, here is the key. Here's the key. If you have an independent clause on both sides of the coordinating conjunction, see those? Then that means you have an independent clause and then another independent clause. That's two independent clauses. And there's only two ways to join independent clauses. So that means you need a comma right there with your coordinating conjunction, just like we have. See that? Hallelujah. Look at that. That's awesome. We did it. Yay, we did it. We did it. Now, I'm going to go, I'm going to pull some of these down. Uh, this semester, students may choose pass fail or they may keep their letter grade. All right. So let's do this thing. Let's do this thing. All right. This semester, students may choose pass fail or they may keep their letter grade. Yes. Yes, indeed, those are two independent clauses. You can walk up to someone in the hall and say either one of those. This semester, students may choose pass-fail. Sure. Or you can say, they may keep their letter grade. Yeah, both good. So they are both independent clauses. That means you have a compound sentence, and you need to put a comma before your coordinated conjunction there. The or, you see the or, you got to have the comma before that. Now, if you don't put the comma, if you don't put that comma right there, if you don't put that comma right there, then it is a run-on sentence. It's a run-on sentence. It is two independent clauses fused together improperly. Okay. All right. Great. Now, how about this one down here? I generally do not like coconut. Okay, this is true, by the way. Ugh. I might be able to tolerate a little. Okay, both full sentences, aren't they? Both full sentences, so we have the coordinated conjunction here with the comma, shazam. And what type of sentence is that? It is a compound sentence. You just compounded two independent clauses. See, all you got to do is be able to figure out and notice and uh, parse your sentences for the clauses and phrases, whether they're in, whether they're independent or dependent, and that is like that's the whole trick right there. That's the the sky the sky opens up for you, and you're like, oh, I need a comma there. Independent clause, independent clause. Wait, Shauna Felt says there's only two ways to join them: comma and a coordinating conjunction, and a, and a semicolon. I'm fresh out of semicolons, so this is it. All right now, I want to. This is the perfect time to say. What you're looking for is the second subject, all right? Now, 
if this said, I generally do not like coconut, but might be able to tolerate a little, that would be not a compound, compound sentence. That would be a simple sentence with a compound predicate. So what you are looking for is that second subject, the word, the, in this case, the word I, okay? Right there, I. If it does not have the I right there, look, I generally do not like coconut, but might be able to tolerate a little. You can't walk up to somebody in the hall and say, might be able to tolerate a little. No. So what you're looking for is that second subject. Look up here in this sentence, they was the second subject. It was wonderful to hear the rain and the grass is green now. That's the second subject. All right, what about, oh, but those, okay, people. People is the second subject in this sentence. The Olmex is the su second subject here. And I is the second subject here. Nice. That is what you're looking for. If you have a second subject, nine times out of ten, you need the comma. But even to take it even further and be really sure, just check both sides of the sentence, both sides of uh, the coordinated conjunction. And if it's a full sentence on both sides, you need the comma there. It's, it's, a, it's a rule. It, it's a learn it and you get better grades. And people think you're smart too. So here we go. Here we go. Okay. I, let's see here. All right. So because, let's look at one more, let's look at a couple more. Because of my Russian heritage, let's do this thing. Because of my Russian heritage is a dependent clause, right? Yeah, but it's also a introductory element, right? It's at the beginning of the sentence. It starts with because, because of my Russian heritage, comma. So you know you need a comma after all introductory elements, but you also know that that's a dependent clause, all right? Because of my Russian heritage, I do not like bowling. I'm not a big bowler, but I'm not Russian either. Uh, I do not like bowling, nor do I like basketball. Look, this I know when you use the word nor, when you use the coordinating conjunction nor, it gets weird like this. You can't really walk up to someone in the hall and say, do I like basketball as a declarative sentence? And they would think it's a question or that means, but with the word nor, we just have to suspend some disbelief. It is a full sentence. I do not like bowling, nor do I like basketball. Okay, good. We have two full sentences here. So we have a coordinated conjunction. People generally, very few people use nor. But um, it is one of our choices here, one of the seven words. Yes, so we have an independent clause, an independent clause, and now we have the coordinating conjunction with the comma. This right here is a introductory element. It's a dependent clause. So that makes this sentence right here compound complex because we have independent clause, independent clause, and dependent clause. Yep, and it's all joined up properly, so we are good to go. All right. Okay, good. I generally do not like coconut, but might be able to tolerate a little. That's what I was talking about a minute ago. This is a simple sentence. I, I generally do not like coconut, but might be able to tolerate a little. What's it missing? Why don't you have the comma there before the but? What's it missing? It is missing that second subject. There's no I there. See that right there? See that? Same thing with this here. This semester, students may choose pass fail or keep their letter grade. Compare that with up here when I have the second subject. See, if there's a second subject, you need the comma. If there's not a second subject, you don't need the comma. This semester, students may choose pass fail or keep their letter grade. You can't walk to someone in the hall and say, keep their letter grade, right? But you can walk to someone in the hall and say, they may keep their letter grade. 
It's weird, but yeah, okay. All right, good. So you're looking for that second subject. These last two sentences don't have it, and that makes them simple sentences with compound predicates. Okay, good. What are the two ways to join independent clauses? Semicolon, yes. But for our discussion today, in, I'm sorry, for our discussion today, coordinating conjunction with a comma. What are the coordinating conjunctions? And, or, nor, for, but, yet, so. And that's it. That is it. All right, good. Now, the next one is items in series. There is a new kind of a fad going around that uh, makes people believe that you don't need this last comma in an item, in a, a series of items. I love apples, comma, oranges, comma, and pears. You do need it. You do need it. You do need it. You need it for clarity. You need it for clarity. And I think you agree with me that you've been reading and without that last comma in, in a, a series of items, uh, a lot of times it gets muddled. It gets nebulous. We're not sure what goes with uh, what, and we'll see that in just a second. S Billy, Sally, and George have come to stay with me this weekend. Fine, great. Items in series, you separate all the items in the series, including the last, with commas. I love to eat apples. I love to sip wine. And I love to eat cheese. Great. Keep, I want you to notice something here. This is an independent clause. Yeah. This is an independent clause. Yeah. And this is an independent clause. Good. But in this case right here, they are being used as items in a series. I love to eat apples. I love to sip wine. And I love to eat cheese fine. And technically it doesn't break the rule because here we have the coordinating conjunction and the comma. Now, check it out. Here's what we were saying earlier. If you don't have that last comma, look at what it would do to this sentence. Look at what it would do to this sentence. I love to eat apples. I love to sip wine and I love to eat cheese. It would make it into a uh, this would be a comma splice because independent clause, comma, no, and another independent, this would be a comma splice, and this would be a run-on sentence. So it'd be a run-on sentence and a comma splice, two different types of run-on sentences at once. So the, the last, that last uh, comma is important. All right, moving on. We swim and surf, eat and laugh and drink and sing. Again, look at this, again, again. We swim and surf. Okay, good. That's the first item in series. We swim and surf. Eat and laugh is the second. And uh, drink and sing. Okay. It's not great writing, I would say, but without this last comma right here, it becomes a jumbled nightmare of a mess. We swim and surf, eat and laugh and drink and sing. <laughs> need the last comma. You need the last comma. The sky will fall, the moon will crumble, and the sea will boil. Once again, they are independent clauses put into series. Okay, on to the next rule. Non-restrictive elements. You guys, you guys. This is the most difficult comma rule of all. But it's really not. It's really not. It's really, once you get it, it's really super, super, super easy. I think it's the wording that screws students up. Okay, there's a non-restrictive element, but I want you to think of it as a non-essential element. A non-essential element is something, it could be a clause, a phrase, it could be words, in a sentence that is non-essential to the meaning of the sentence. You can pluck that element out of the sentence and not change the meaning of the sentence. You'll see what I mean. Uh, former, former President Barack Obama lives in Chicago, Illinois. Okay? But you don't get it until you see this. Barack Obama, comma, 
our former president. Now this part right here, this part is the part that is non-essential. Because presumably everybody on the planet knows who Barack Obama is. I, I, I think that's probably true. I mean, there might be some tribes out in the middle of the Papua New Guinea that don't know or something, but that's the exception, not the rule. Everybody knows who Barack Obama is. He's the former president. So that portion I have highlighted right there is extra added. It's added stuff. It's added stuff. Well, it's just it's ancillary. If it's ancillary, if it's added, if it's non-essential, enclose it in commas. It's very much like parentheses. Parentheses, right? If you open a parenthesis, parentheses, you have to close it, right? You can't just open it and then just, you're like, it has, to, it has to be opened and closed. Same with commas in this case. Barack Obama, comma, our former president, comma, lives in Chicago, Illinois. Now, if it's at the end of the sentence, you get a reprieve. I'll show you that in a second. But, but here we go. Why is it not that way up here? Hmm. Why is it not? Let's see. Former President Barack Obama. Okay. 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 Look, Barack Obama. If you just say former president, it could mean a whole ton of people, right? I mean, there's how many of them living? Four, five of them living right now. I believe so. Anyway, there's there's a. But it could mean a lot of people. Former president, right? Former president. Once you put Barack Obama there, it restricts the whole meaning of the sentence. It restricts everything else out in that sentence. It changes the meaning of that sentence. It can only be Barack Obama. It can only be Barack Obama. It can't be Bill Clinton. It can't be... Okay, so if it is essential, uh, a.k.a. restrictive, but if it's essential to the meaning of the sentence, do not... Enclose it in commas. Essential, no commas. Non-essential, extra stuff, commas. Put extra stuff in commas. That's it. That's it. Put extra stuff in commas. Just like parentheses. Just like my parentheses up here kind of have, the, have this here. You know, it's, it's like you want to have, it's like an extra thought, an afterthought, an added thought, an interrupting expression. All right. I drove around all day because my pet dinosaur got loose. <laughs> all right, I want to key in on this word right here, because, because, because I drove around all day. Now, you drove around all day, fine. You could be driving around all day for a gazillion reasons. You could be, uh, you could be out trying to... Uh, trying to uh, catch wild coyotes. You could be out trying to f get a date. You could be out uh, delivering. You, heck, you could be an Uber driver. You'd be out all day doing any of those things. So we don't know. I drove around all day. It's vague. Who knows what you're doing? You could, out be tr you could, you could be out trying to score crack or something. I don't know. Now, <laughs> when when we go like this because this word because the word because necessarily restricts the sentence doesn't it it necessarily always always the word because tells you the reason why something is happening and because it tells you the reason why something is happening it is definitely essential to the sentence therefore write this in your notebooks there is never a comma before the word because. The word because always and forever sets up a restrictive element, a essential element. Because check this out. Why was I out driving around all day? Because my pet dinosaur got loose. And now that makes all that makes a world of difference, you know? I mean, you can be uh, out uh, delivering uh, Uber Eats and be a sane person. But now you have told me that you were out looking for your pet dinosaur. And I know you're nuts. <laughs>
No, but doesn't it restrict the sentence? Does, I drove around all day. Why? Because I was looking for my pet dinosaur. What could be more essential to that sentence than the bit about the pet dinosaur? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, so there's never a comma there before the word because. Right? All right, now let's go on. I drove around all day, comma, which was super boring. Now, this word which always sets up a non-essential element. A non-essential element. So, you have the comma. I want you to notice that if it's at the end of the sentence, this is the non-essential element. I said that they're like parentheses. Yep. If you open it, you have to close it. However, if it's at the end of a sentence, you can you can just use the one comma comma which was super boring. Now, the idea that driving around all day was super boring does not change anything about the fact that you drove around all day. It just gives you ancillary extra information about how your emotional state was while you were driving around. It's not like saying, I drove around all day because my pet dinosaur got loose. That, that is essential <laughs> information. That is essential information because my pet dinosaur, but which was super boring is not. The word which always has a comma in front of it. Always. It sets up a non-essential element. Okay, good. The, the labor candidate who raised the least money was deemed non-viable. This portion here in the center, this is sort of an interrupting expression. It is a non-restrictive element because the labor candidate, it, the fact that the labor candidate raised the least money doesn't change anything about the fact that this candidate was deemed non-viable. So this is a non-essential element, a non-restrictive element. And what do we do with non-restrictive elements? We enclose them in commas just like parentheses. Great. All right. Cooking with gasoline now, baby! All right, Edward, who often pirates movies, is reckless and unstable. Good, you know what I'm gonna do? You know what I'm gonna do? Edward, this idea about him often pirating movies is uh, ancillary, it's extra. Enclose it in commas. Enclose extra stuff in commas, like parentheses. Professor Kent, laughing loudly, said he forgot the quiz. Great. This laughing loudly bit here, that is an interrupting expression. It's just something that happened. It's an afterthought. It's, a, it's something that happened in the middle of the sentence. It's a non-essential element. It's a parenthetical element. So you put it in commas. Bueno. Bueno. All right. Now I will check into the I will check into the insane asylum next week so that I will get better. I will check into the insane asylum next week so that I will get better. So it's this in portion here, I, this idea that uh, I will check into the insane asylum. That's enough, but it's essential for me to say the reason the reason. I am checking in is so that I will get better. That tells you I'm crazy and I need to go get help. So that definitely tells me more about the reason I'm going to the insane asylum next week. So there's no comma there. It is a essential element. Okay, next, 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 next. All right. So here we go with that versus which. All right. I alluded to it just a minute ago. That is a word that always sets up a restrictive or essential element. That is a word before which there's never a comma, just like because. Because and that should never have commas before them because they set up essential elements, otherwise known as restrictive elements. All right, the word which sets up a non-essential element, so you do need the comma. The words that and because, no comma. The word which, 
always a comma. Brad's earphones have fancy ear pads. The, uh, Brad's earphones that have fancy ear pads were a gift from his brother. That's an ear. Were a gift from his brother. Okay. Brad's earphones that have fancy ear pads. This is the portion in question. Okay. That have fancy ear pads. The question is, do you enclose that in commas? And the answer is no, because it restricts the Brad. Brad may have 50 pairs of earphones, but these are the ones with fancy ear pads. That's necessary. It's essential. So you do not enclose it in commas. Trucks that are used for hauling purposes usually lack fuel efficiencies. All right, check it out. The word that is right here. Trucks that are used for hauling purposes. All right. That portion, that clause is an essential element because it tells you what type of trucks. It's essential. It has the word that, no commas. The knife in my kitchen that has a broken handle is dangerous to use. There's the word that has a broken handle is dangerous. Okay. That tells you which knife it is. It couldn't be more essential. No commas. All right, here we go. Billy's guitar, which is painted red, has a hole in the soundboard. Okay. This idea that it is painted red is ancillary. It's, it's extra stuff. Billy's guitar, uh, it's painted red, has a hole in the soundboard. All right. Now, I know this is, is alarmingly similar to the fancy ear pads. Uh, Billy's guitar, which is painted red, has a hole in the soundboard. You can think of it just like this. When you use the word which, that signals that it is not essential. Billy's guitar, which is painted red, that's just added stuff, has a hole in the soundboard. Presumably, there's only one guitar in Billy's arsenal of guitars that has a hole in the soundboard. And the, the idea that it is painted red is just extra stuff. If it's extra stuff, enclose it in commas, like parentheses. Great. Colin's favorite diner, which serves excellent breakfast, is in Austin, Texas. All right, this right here, which serves Excellent breakfast is added additional extra stuff and close it in commas. It is a non-essential element, a non-restrictive element. My circular saw, which has a new blade, weighs four pounds. Which has a new blade is extra stuff. My circular saw, I've only got one. My circular saw, you know, it has, it has an, a new blade. Oh, it weighs four pounds. It's an interrupting expression. It is non-essential and you need you enclose non-essential elements in commas, like an afterthought. Okay, in parentheses. Okay, go. Okay, 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 okay. They eat worms there, which is totally gross. This totally gross bit at the end is added extra stuff. Okay, good. Coordinate adjectives. Use a comma to separate two or more coordinate adjectives. Uh, if the word and sounds okay, you may use a comma. That's that'll be clear right here. All right, General Custer was a difficult, stubborn officer. Now, what we're talking about here is you're asking yourself between the words difficult and stubborn, should there be a comma? Well, you just, you just take this little word and here. You ask yourself, you ask yourself, can you say General Custer was a difficult and stubborn officer. And it sounds fine to me. General Custer was a difficult and stubborn officer. So if you can put the word and between the two adjectives, then it is okay to call them coordinate adjectives and put the comma there. General Custer was a difficult, stubborn officer. Good. Great. How about this? It is a hot, sticky day. Is it, it is a hot and sticky day? Yeah. So you have the comma. It is a hot and sticky day. Yeah, yeah. So the comma's fine there. They're coordinate, coordinate adjectives. All right. Sarah made a three-tiered red velvet 
chocolate covered birthday cake. All right. Sarah made a three tiered and red velvet and chocolate covered birthday cake. I mean, it, it, it's not great English, but yeah, it's, it sounds okay. The, a three tiered and red velvet and chocolate covered birthday cake. Yeah, so you can use those commas as coordinate adjectives. Okay, the pianist played a beautiful haunting melody. A beautiful and haunting melody? Yeah, that's fine, so you have the comma. The cold December wind chilled me to my bones. Now, why no comma here? You just wouldn't say the cold and December wind because December wind is, is, a, is a thing and this is, a, this is the cold version of that thing, you know? So, the cold December wind chilled me to the bones. You can't put the and between there so there's no comma there. So it's, it's, a, it's a December wind and it's cold. But up here, it's a uh, choc It's a birthday cake, but it's chocolate covered and red velvet and three tiered. Right. So those are all adjectives that are, that are equal to one another, whereas cold describes December wind. Okay, good. All right, all right, all right, all right. Now we're going to move on. We lived in a white two-story house. All right, so, so right here you do not need the comma because you can't put the and between there. We lived in a white and two-story house. Nah, nah, so no comma. They're not coordinate adjectives. Okay, good. Quotations. This is a big one. Uh, students screw this up all the time. Now, let's look at this. There is going to be a comma before and after all quotations. Look right here. Bam. 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 See that? Yeah. Okay, great. Great. So Jill told the detective, comma, he was around six feet tall wearing a gray hoodie. So look, this is the same thing as saying Sally said, Sally asked, uh, John remarked, uh, uh, Bill proclaimed, Joe claims. All of those scenarios set up a either either a quotation coming or a, a bit of dialogue, same kind of thing. When you do that, you have to have a comma for it. Sally asked, comma, what's the difference? The shortfall is about $100, Steve replied. So it works, it works both on both sides here. We have it uh, you know, coming and going, as it were. So we have it here, Sally asked, and then we have down here, Steve replied. Now look, I want you to notice this. This is very important. Ingrain that in your memory forever. Put it there now. Don't screw around. Put it there. Commas and periods go inside the quotation marks. Commas and periods go inside the quotation marks. Commas and periods go inside the quotation marks. Okay, yes, unless you're in England. If you're in England, you're on your own, man. I don't know. There's some weird things going on over there. All right, so, 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 so. Commas and periods go inside the quotation marks. But here we have Steve replied, the commas inside the quotation marks. You have to have a comma, you have to have a comma before and after a, a quotation. Now, here's the exception. It's not really an exception, but uh, a little bit different. In the eighth stanza, now notice I didn't put a comma there. Why? Because it is one prepositional phrase in the eighth stanza. One prepositional phrase. I decided not to. Okay, no comma there for an introductory element. In the eighth stanza, the raven answers, comma, nevermore. Fine. Now, but you should always, usually, you're always going to have a MLA citation here. That's what this looks like. So now notice that the comma, the period here is on the outside of the parenthetical or in-text citation. 
Normally, if you look up here, it goes inside the quotation marks, inside. But if there is a citation, it goes after the citation to end it. Good, 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 good. All right, moving along, parenthetical expressions. This is just what we talked about earlier. It's added extra additional stuff. The scenery, on the other hand, but these are more like expressions. The scenery, on the other hand, is rather boring. You can see, on the other hand, is enclosed in commas because it's it's a, it's a parenthetical uh, parenthetical element or parenthetical expression. In this case, however, students did very well. Fat Tuesday, which is always a party. Now we're back to that word which. We know that that has to have comma right on on a, before it if it ends a sentence and around the clause that that it's in if it's a uh, interrupting expression like this. Good. Now, dates and addresses have a specific thing with commas here. All right, so check it, check it, check it. Uh, there's two different, two different varietals here. On April 24th, 2020, comma. Basically, you just have to have this comma right here after the year. Same thing with the state. You got to have the comma after the state. Okay. This is the one difference here is if you do the military date uh, format, 20 April 2020, you only need that one comma. Whereas up here, you need the comma, you need the comma uh, after, after the uh, April 24th, just so that all those numbers don't run together. I prefer this date right here. I mean, it's, I, I was in the military, but that's not really it. It just, it separates the, the numbers. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Now down here we have uh, 704 Congress Avenue, comma, Austin, comma, Texas, comma. And if you put a county, you can close the county too. If you put a, a, a nation after that, USA, and close all of that in commas. All right. Good. All right. Now here's a few other rules just to send you on your way with. Never, just ingrain this in your mind, never separate the subject and verb of a sentence with just one comma. If you separate the subject, the main subject, and the main verb of a sentence, there better be two commas. Because remember, it's got to be a parenthetical type of expression where if you open it, you close it. If you separate it for, by one comma and you're, you're like, crossing the streams and the universe ends. Uh, never place a comma before the word because. We covered that. Because, the word because sets up a restrictive element always, an essential element. It gives you more information about why I was out driving around all day. Because my pet dinosaur got loose. God. <laughs> almost never, almost never place a comma before the word that. There are some rare exceptions, but for our case, for our, for our purposes today, just tell yourself, don't put a comma before the word that, all right? Commas go inside quotation marks, so do periods, okay? Uh, the other question, the other marks are a little more complicated. Um, they go, if they're tall, they bump their head on the quotation marks, and so they can't get under there, unless they were already there when the quotes came. So if the, if the uh, like my, my novel is what gods would be theirs with a question mark. Now that question mark goes with the title. So if you put that in quotes, then that question mark goes inside there. Uh, but it just always commas and periods go inside the quotation marks unless there is a parenthetical citation. Enclose proper names and commas when directly addressing an individual like, hey, Martha. Martha should be in enclosed in commas. All right. Thank you very much. Well, that's it, you guys. Uh, just remember, just remember what I told you about the uh, different parts of a sentence, the clauses, the uh, the phrases. Determine whether it's independent or dependent, whether it's an introductory element or a non-essential element. And all of those things, it, it, just, it just becomes very clear. Fi first parse the sentence, find the clauses, 
find the phrases, determine whether they're independent or dependent, and then look for some of these words like because, which, that, uh, and definitely the coordinating conjunctions, and, or, nor, for, but, yet, so. And once you get all that down, your comma rules will just fall into place.